just so you know, the United Youth Night thing, we used to do it all the time in Southern California, and it was always fantastic. And uh, the worst that could happen is you could find a spouse. Like, a lot of you guys have big families here, you know. Sometimes the, the gene pool's running kind of low, and everyone at church is your first cousin or second cousin. And it's good. Spread your wings. It's all right. Anyways, um, I have some of my own announcements before we get all uh, uh, in the Bible and what the Lord's been speaking to me. So uh, first annou- announcement is this. Next Friday, a week from today, I'll be taking it really early in the morning a group of guys to Watsonville to go paint a church that's in really bad disrepair. Like, the pastor is so happy about it, he's giddy every time he texts me at my house. Like, I'll get a pastor, uh, a pastor, pastor Ray will, will text me, and everything's just smiley face emojis with sunglasses and thumbs up. And he's like a, some 50-year-old guy. He's just, he's ecstatic. This church has been in disrepair for years. Uh, I'm sure it's been something on their prayer list. Like, hey, our church is a bucket, and it's falling apart. And, uh, and God listened. He put it on our hearts. We're going to go there. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, we're all going to be standing like uh, camp style. We're all going to be sleeping inside the fellowship hall of the church. I brought a camp shower that's on propane. So we literally will be washing the day away in the back parking lot, <laughs> surrounded by apartment complexes. It's going to be awesome. And then uh, uh, we'll be going to the beach. We've got some skin boards, some surfboards. I don't know how to use them, but I'm pretty sure hopefully no... No testimonies come back from the trip like I was in the ocean and I almost died. Hopefully none of that happens. Um, So that's happening from Friday to Monday. If you want to go, remind me that I talked to you and that you want to go. Because right now we're about 15, 20 deep, which is awesome. Because literally I got two pressure washers, blowers, everything. And we're just going to knock this thing out and have plenty of time for fun. And fellowship. It's really about fellowship. Going together, eating together, uh, you know using a camp shower together, but uh, that's, that's next week, and then uh, for anyone interested in going to Mozambique with me and my wife, uh, September 4th through, I believe, the 17th or 18th, we're going to be going to Mozambique, where there's a Church of God church over there, and there's a, a woman there from Brazil. Uh, she's been there for 16 years. Uh, she runs a church and a, and a children's school, the only one in the area. There are about 860-some students at her school, and they're in need of some classrooms, some fencing, and just general work over there. And she has like a constant, uh, uh, she's like there's always a cycle of missionaries going there. Like we're just going to miss another team who is there, which is great because the country has been devastated by floods and storms. Uh, they're in Africa, so they already are living like, here. And uh, the more people who go there and minister the gospel to them in all kinds of different ways from building to hanging out and doing Awana stuff with all those kids or uh, guys building with me just represents and shows them the love of Christ. It's a a great thing. Amen. Uh, If you are interested in that trip, I kind of need to know whether you're going by next Friday and I need 1400 bucks for a plane ticket from you as well. Uh, We've gotten to that point where they're buying all the tickets together. That way all 15, 20 of us or whatever are going, we all meet in New York, and then we all arrive in Africa at the same time and take the same bus so it's not just a mess. I usually just tell missionaries, hey, meet me in this country at this airport on this day. (laughs) Go for it. Uh, But these are Americans. They don't do things like that. They're really organized, and uh, we're going with them this time. So uh, pray about it. You still have some time if you want to go. I believe there's six or seven of us going from this church alone. And uh, there's a group of like nine people from North Carolina going. Uh, the main guy from there is kind of cool. He's a marine biologist. He does all the pHs in the waters at, a, at an aquatic park. And the guy is super gifted in MacGyvering water filtration systems for people to drink so they don't die. So the guy, the guy goes to these villages and he shows them how to build these filters so they could take like pupukaka water from like a pond and just run it through these filters and they could live off of it and not get sick. So that's like a whole other thing that's happening on our same trip, but I think it's cool. Like, I think it's really cool. So there's a lot of things happening in that trip. So let's get into tonight. Before I get into tonight, I got to kind of, kind of build up why I'm getting what I'm getting into tonight. And that's the last couple of weeks of my life. In the last two, three, four weeks of my life, have been, uh, have been different in the way that uh, I've been putting more of a demand on my faith. I don't know if that makes sense. 
you as a Christian could just live as a Christian and do school and do everything else, but there comes a few times in life when you put a demand on your faith and you're really relying on God for something. Well, it just so happens that the last three or four weeks, I've, having, I've been having to put a demand on my faith every week. Like, God, this week i got to preach Sunday night. And man, all week I've been kind of in his presence praying about it. And the next week I had to pray at a wedding. And the next week I had to give it in them. And the next week I had to pray at something else and I preach at something else. And, and it just kept building up and it kept building up. And I, I noticed like uh, I, I was at a point in my walk in these last few weeks where where something happens when you start putting a big demand on your faith, when you, when, you, when you don't just live life for yourself, but you're living life, walking with God, de- dependent on Him and saying, God, I need, I need this to happen. I have faith that you will speak when I open my mouth, that God, you will give me a subject that you want to preach to your bride, that God, you will give me a message that I could preach to these young people that will last with them for the rest of their lives, that God, you would give me what your bride needs to hear this morning for this and them. And, and then the byproduct of spending so much time in his presence and and pushing and putting so many demands on my faith in God is this, that I look back at these last few weeks and most of the things that so easily hinder me as far as mediocrity and and, and sins and, and bitterness and anger and having a foul mouth and all these things, I haven't had to struggle with them as much because I've been putting a demand on my faith. I haven't had so much time to think about how bad things are for me because I haven't had time because I've been pursuing God more than just pursuing my own life and ambitions. And as hard as it seems uh, uh, to, to do that, the thing that happened uh, this last week is uh, it all kind of came to a culmination and I was like, Lord, I'm chasing after you. I'm doing everything that I think I should be doing, God. And God, I need you for everything. And I'm at this point where, God, I'm putting so many demands on my faith that it's starting to get scary because the stakes are so high, Lord. I I looked at it, and I was talking to my wife, and this trip is coming up. And and things you guys don't even understand about, like, okay, I got to pay for my ticket, pay for my wife's ticket. I got to come up with like $5,000 for myself and sponsorship or coming out of my own pocket. I got to organize all these people. I got to get all the work organized. I got to do all these things. I got to go to the Watsonville. I got to build a church. I got to do my own ministry. I got to be a deacon at the church. Oh, yeah. And I got to raise $15,000 on top of it for money to build what I'm building in Africa. And all these things are starting to weigh down on my shoulders. And I'm starting to have like this crazy panic attack. Even yesterday, Mike walks into my office. I'm just sitting there and I'm, I'm like catatonic. I'm just sitting there. I was like, Ugh. and he's like, what's going on, Peter? And I just, Bleh. this is what I got going on. And I have to preach tomorrow night. And, and I got all these things going on. And, and, and in my heart and in my mind, I keep thinking about, Lord, you know, I'm pursuing you. I'm putting demands on my faith. And I, I've, I don't feel like I've ever been closer to you because the more demands I put on my faith, the more, the more he leads me into harder things. The more he leads me into harder things, the more I have to rely on him, the more I have to rely on him, the more my the, the intimacy and my relationship with Jesus grows and with his Holy Spirit. And the, the more I rely on him and I hear from him and I say, okay, that's you because I just heard you yesterday and I heard you today and I know I'll hear you tomorrow and I get in this walk and then I look at the suffering that I'm putting myself through and I say, God, look at all the stress that I have in my life. None of it's about my kids. They're doing great. None of it's about my marriage. It's not perfect, but it's good. None of it's about my finances. I live at church. I don't have rent. But God, here I am. I'm stressing myself out. I'm running a million miles an hour. I'm all spun out, God. And it's all for other people. And something uh, uh, kind of dawned on me that when we're pursuing God and we're putting demands on our faith, something's going to happen where it gets to the point where, where we're asked to love first. And it's so hard because you think about it. It's like, Father, I'm going to come here and I'm going to sacrifice a big part of my life and I'm going to build in this church and I'm stressed out. And God, I don't even know the congregation that will be in there someday. I don't even know if I'm going to be part of that someday. You're asking me as your follower to sacrifice everything today to love first the people that I don't even know. And I don't even know if I'm going to get rewarded for it. And it's like, God, it puts you in a real gut check. Like, what am I really living for? Do I really believe in the gospel that I first heard, that I I claim to be a part of? Do I really decide to live my life as Christ did, to sacrifice everything for me and not look to his own needs? Am I really going to love them first? And I looked at it as like, God, of course I am, God, but it's so hard and I need your help because it's seemingly impossible, God. I'm destroying myself in stress. I'm, I'm spending every waking moment praying about it for people who don't know my name that I can go build them something because God that's the example you've given us because you loved us first you got the ball rolling when there was no love you loved me when I didn't love you 
And that's the hardest thing as followers of Christ. He asks us to love people first, even knowing you don't know them, even knowing you don't know the reward you're going to get out of it. You don't know if you're going to get a reward. I don't know if these people who, who are going to inhabit that church even know my name. I don't know if those little kids will ever know my name who I'm going to go build a school for. But I know this, if I'm going to follow Christ's example, I'm going to be following him and putting demands on my faith. And he's going to ask me to do things that are bigger than myself. And the thing that's biggest out of all these things is he's going to ask me to love other people first without any kind of promise or inclination that they'll ever be able to pay me back for the love that I'm going to invest in them. Adi, I think you could think about this with discipleship. You invest your love, your time, Sam, Mike, and all these people who come to your small groups, and you don't know if you'll ever see it back, but God's calling us to love people first, to start that ball, to start that relationship, just like he did with us when he loved us to die on a cross and we didn't deserve it, amen? And that's real talk. That's really being a Christian. A lot of people think about Christianity, about receiving your laundry list of what you have. And when I speak to you guys, I don't ever want to perpetuate just a feel-good Christianity. Christianity is this, following Christ's example, dying to self and doing the Father's will. A daily walk with Christ is putting demands on your faith and loving people first, even if you don't know you're going to get anything back, even if you never see a reward for it a day in your life until you go see Jesus face to face and he says when everybody else was blind and didn't see it I saw when you painted that wall I saw when you changed that siding I saw when you put that brick on top of the other one enter to your reward good and faithful servant it's hard it's not easy but it's what we're called to do amen as I was sitting before the Lord, I was like, Lord, what should I preach on tonight? Because God, I don't want to just preach on something. I want to preach what your bride needs to hear tonight. I know your word's alive. I don't want to just go through this and just Google a verse. God, lead me. It's your church. You're going to lead me. Holy Spirit, you guide me to a verse. And this is what he guided me to this morning. And it's out of the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. And in this, we're going to read about it. It's about a father coming to the disciples to have his son healed and and have demons cast out of him that are making this kid mute and have seizures and throw himself in a fire and the water is trying to kill himself. And this is the story. And before I read this story, I want to, to kind of put a warning out there. Not everything's a demon, okay? All right? Sometimes people are just sick. So it's not, there is no demon haunting your car. The battery's probably just dead. If you have a cold, it's probably just a virus. It's not the demon of a cold. I don't have a, a demonic presence making me lazy. I am just lazy, okay? I'm not saying those things can't happen. Also, let, let, me, let me warn you with this too. Uh, before you get all Bethel-y on me, okay? Uh, uh, if you feel God has called you to a deliverance ministry where you're gonna cast out demons, you're not going to go around just assuming people are full of the devil. When God gives you a kind, that kind of gift, he will also give you discernment to know when to use it. He's not going to give you a gun without a target. He's not going to give you a hammer without a nail. If God gives you a deliverance ministry, he will give you discernment to know who needs delivered. Amen? Okay. Here's, I just had to say that because people can get really weird, man. Really weird. Like, man, I was trying to come to church and, uh, Oh, man, I ran out of gas. The devil's after me. He's like, no, dude, you just didn't put gas in your car. <laughs> the devil has nothing to do with this. <laughs> also, I hear testimonies about that. Just a newsflash. God, Jesus, is omnipresent. God is everywhere all the time. Jesus is inside of me, inside of James, inside of Peter at all times. The devil, not omnipresent. There's just one of them. He's not attacking all of you. <laughs> and, uh, and usually there is demonic influences out there that work like that, but most likely it's not the devil who's harassing you. Usually it's your carnal faith and your own flesh. Anyways, that's my disclaimer. Thank you. The more you know. <laughs> you know? So here we go. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When they had... When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and, and teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as uh, all the people saw Jesus, th they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Jesus says, what are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought 
You, my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech, whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And this is what Jesus says. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long should I be with you and how long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion and he fell to the ground and he rolled around foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire and water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus says, if I can, Jesus says, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was, was, uh, was uh, running to the scene, he rebuked the unpure st- spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then the spirit shrieked and convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much much like a corpse that that many said he's dead but Jesus took him by the hand and he lifted him onto his feet and he said and as he stood him up Jesus had gone indoors and his disciples asked him privately why couldn't we drive it out and he replied to his disciples he said this this kind come out by prayer only amen amen So we see here, we got this crazy story happening over here. We got this dad and he's trying to figure out what's going on with his son. And you see that his dad of the boy comes to the disciples, not just anybody, but the dad literally comes to Jesus' disciples and he brings him the son. And, 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 And you see over here in verse 18, where's 18? It says, whenever it seized him, it threw him on the ground. And then I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Right? There's going to be problems in our lives and things God's calling us to. There's going to be ministries that God's called us to that he's made for you to do and to walk in. There's going to be sins that are in your life that are demonically influenced to be there that you can't get rid of. And you see, and and I believe that the Bible and the words of Jesus 2,000 years ago when they were written, and even today, I believe the word of God is alive and well. I believe it's good for us to learn from, and it speaks to us even today as it did then. And I believe that there's a certain way Jesus says things that makes the Bible alive that when we hear it today it's still relevant and rings true in our hearts listen there is a problem this man has and he goes to people and they can't resolve it and I want to say there is problems that we have and there's burdens that we carry and there's things like that fifteen thousand dollars and all the sponsorships and there's things in your life and ministries God's called you to do and you have gone to people and you have gone to friends and you've gone to youth leaders and you've gone to other people but they can't help you because Jesus orchestrated it that way. He has placed certain difficulties in my life and in your life that are so big it will force us to his cross, to our knees. It'll humble us and we'll have to go to Christ and Christ alone and in his name say, God, I've tried everything. I am emptying myself out before you, Lord. God, if it's not you, I cannot do anything. And you got to understand there's going to be hardships and sins and things and battles in your life that you can go to all kinds of people, but they're not going to be resolved by anybody until you go to Jesus alone alone until you bring it before the foot of the cross and you go to him and that's the way he wanted it because he wants to teach you how to walk with him how to rely on him yeah is it good to have a circle of people yeah I have a circle of people around me that I pray with all the time is it good to have people to confide in and a small group to bring up your problems yes but there's going to be things that God's called you to do and things that you need to rid your life out of that you're going to have to learn on your own two feet to walk and talk with Jesus on your own and it's the way he made it he didn't make it that way because he's a mean God because he's a jealous God and he wants all of you he doesn't want part of your trust to be in mankind he doesn't want part of your trust to be in a pastor or in a prophet or anyone else he wants your trust to be solely and wholly on him alone amen that's why it's like that that's why the word says it like this this is why the bible when it was written it brought this part up it didn't just exclude it it didn't say this man just came to Jesus and Jesus cast out the demon it went through the efforts of saying hey sometimes you'll go to the other disciples and it's not enough you need to learn to go to the source of where all miracles and healings come from and that's Jesus amen 
So this is the way it was meant to be. And in, in verse 19, it goes on and says this, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long should I be with you? And how long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me, he says. And if everything in here was meant for, for a meaning, it was meant to minister to us, and if the Holy Spirit really did place this on my heart, I believe this is what Jesus and the word of the Lord is for us, not just for me, for us here tonight in this room or even anyone listening on YouTube somewhere down the road. Listen, Jesus doesn't just, he could have just said, you unbelieving generation, how long should I be with you? Oh, but he doesn't say it like that. What is this referred to sometimes? What kind of weapon is this referred to sometimes? It's a sword. What's a sword do? It pierces and divides. A sword will divide an arm right off your body or a head right off of your neck. And, and the word of the Lord is so, so, so hurtful and it, it pokes so hard. He says, how long shall I put up with you is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Here are these people who have so much unbelief that they can't cure this boy of this demon that's in him. And Jesus comes to them and he, and he doesn't say, oh, how long should I be with you guys? He says, how long should I be with you guys? And how long should I put up with you? And if those words hurt you like they hurt me, if they poke you in your heart like they poke me in my heart, it's supposed to be like that. And let me tell you the revelation that the Spirit of God had given me on this in my office earlier today. It's supposed to poke and it's supposed to slice and divide a complacency that we've all become comfortable with in our hearts. In our hearts, we all believe on Christ. We believe he could do big things, but we also have this unbelief in our hearts that we say, that's too big for God. God will never do this for me. It's all right. You know, I know his Bible says that, you know, I'm going to be the head and not the tail. I know the Bible says I'll never be made ashamed of, but I know the Bible says river, rivers of living water will flow out of my, my mouth and out, from my stomach forward. And I know the Bible says, you know, uh, I'm going to gain ground for him and I'm going to be a servant for him, but maybe not for me. Maybe that's for somebody else. And somehow we've grown complacent it with unbelief in our heart. And the word of the Lord says this, how long should I deal with you? How long am I going to put up with you? It's not okay to have disbelief. A matter of fact, if you look at this, disbelief angers Jesus. If you look at the words and you really read the way it came out of his mouth, how long shall I be with you? And how long should I put up with you? You know, the Bible says that our faith pleases God. Faith makes him happy. Faith makes God move. And the same way faith makes God move, unbelief upsets him. You believe being the Lord, the Christ, the Messiah, dying for all sin, dying for all disease, dying for all humanity, and all of your humanity that you loved first looks at you and says, I know you're big, I know you're powerful, but you're not big and powerful enough for that. I'm going to carry that with me because I trust you with everything. I trust you with not going to hell, Father, but I don't trust that you'll use me. I don't trust that you'll guide me. I don't trust that you'll fill my mouth with your words that I could explain to people who you are with an eloquence that is not my own. God, I love you, but I don't believe that you'll give me, Father, an unction that when I pray and when I speak words, it'll not be my own power, but your Holy Spirit piercing through them. And we become okay with it. And the Holy Spirit tonight is saying, how long am I going to deal with you? How long am I going to put up with you? How much longer are you going to let unbelief be in your heart and grieve my Holy Spirit? I don't want to let it be there anymore. I want to believe his word. I want to believe what Jesus says about me is true. And this is not something just for tonight. This is something that I've been going through. My whole life I've been thinking I'll never be good enough. I'll always be that stepchild. There'll always be people like Eddie. There'll always be people like Pastor. There'll always be people like Tell. And then there'll be me somewhere on the back seat. But the Lord says something different. And listen, tonight I'm telling you, he says something different about you too. How long will you stand in disbelief? Because it's going to come to a point where Jesus is going to say, how long will I deal with you? How much longer? How many more chances? How many more prophets? How many more messages? How many more times do I have to drill in my mind? And your minds that you're my sons and my daughters and I choose to use you because I paid for you. You're my belongings. I'll do with you what I say I'll do with you. That's what I've been wrestling with. I don't want unbelief in me anymore. I want to be his tool. I want to be used by him. Amen. And I think you guys want to be used by him as well. It's supposed to hurt when you read it. It's supposed to divide that complacency in our heart. Amen? Verse 20. So when they had brought him, when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. Look, 
when you put it in your mind that you're going to love first and you're going to pursue the Lord and you're going to start putting demands on your faith for something that's not for yourself like a car, but for a mission trip or to minister to someone or for someone else's deliverance or for someone else's salvation. Look what happens here. And this is what, this is what I think it's good and prosperous for us to see today. When the demonic spirit that was influencing that boy saw the Savior, the end of its reign in this boy's life coming towards him, it went for a last ditch effort, a Hail Mary past to destroy the boy and threw him in a straight convulsions. Listen to me. When you start on that path of loving first and pursuing God, just know this. Everything will seem like it's broken loose and all of hell's gates have broken loose and everything will go wrong. The other day, Attila decided he was going to go to Africa with me. And then literally like the next week he calls me. is like, hey, do you have a trailer? My motor blew up. Do you think that just happens? Do you think these things are coincidences? When you start pursuing the Lord, everything starts going sideways. When I go on mission trips and my water heater explodes, when I go on mission trips and my car breaks, when I'm in a mission and I'm on, on the work job site and the doorbell's ringing and I realize it's three o'clock in the morning and there's some drug addict out there and my wife and kids are sleeping there and I'm falling to my knees and I'm praying, I know that all hell is breaking loose and it's trying to stop me from accomplishing what God's doing. But here's the good thing. When all hell is breaking loose, we realize this, that all the demonic influences that are breaking hell loose, see the Savior coming and realize its time is up. And when you're going through that battle and when you're going through that hell situation pursuing the Lord, just realize this, it will have an end and God will prevail because it's His will you're pursuing. Amen? Just know that. Know it in your heart. When you see everything going sideways, when everyone's picking a fight with you, when everything's coming up bad and you're pursuing God, just take heart and know that the enemy sees the impending doom that's coming to him because you're pursuing the Savior. And he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And when you're pursuing him and you're chasing after him, he's going to come through and he's going to save the day and he's going to get all the glory. Amen. He's going to get all the honor. He's going to get all the praise just like it was always meant to be. Amen? Amen. Verse 21, it says this. It says, uh, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like that? Let me ask you something. Is there any way that that man could have answered the question that Jesus would have looked at the father and said, oh, he's been like that for 10 years? Okay, I can't heal him. It's the statue of limitations on possession. It's 10 years. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe, maybe Jesus was looking for an answer like, oh, he's only been possessed for a few weeks. Okay, the possession hasn't taken a hole too deep. I could take care of this. Is there anything that this father could have said that would have limited Jesus' ability to cast a demon out of this child? Answer, yes or no? No. So why does Jesus ask this? You know why I, I think he asked this? So we can relate our situations and our problems here in 2019 to his word that's alive and real. And Jesus, in the word of God, is asking you tonight, how long have you been like this? How long has it been? The father answered Jesus and said, he's been like this from childhood. He's always been possessed like this. this. This problem, he didn't say a week, a month, a season. He said since childhood. He's always had this problem. How long have, had you, have you had your problem? How long have you had that thing you've been praying about that you stopped praying about? How long, has, how long ago is it that Jesus promised to use you and you forgot all about it and so much time has passed that you don't even believe that promise could be true anymore? How long have you been asking to get delivered for, from pornography or drugs or, or being angry? How long have you been praying for the same old thing and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to get resolved? Look, in this Bible, Jesus has given an example. It doesn't matter if this is an issue that's plagued you from the day you were born. He is the answer and he could fix it. He's bringing this up in the Bible too. 2,000 years ago that I could bring it up here tonight to remind you that there is no problem, there is no obstacle in your life that has been there so long that Christ has forgotten about it, but he remembers you always. He's never forgotten you. He knows the numbers of hairs on the very head that you have or the lack of them. He is Jesus. It doesn't matter how long you've been going through your struggle. He could heal you. He could deliver you. He could take you to the other side. He is Jesus. He is capable of doing all these things and more. Amen, church? Amen.
It doesn't matter how long you've been struggling with it. It doesn't matter how many times you fell back into that sin. It's terrible that you've fallen into that sin, but Jesus is letting you know this today by the power of his Holy Spirit and take this. It doesn't matter how long. There is no statue of limitations to how many times you've tried and failed. Tonight, Jesus is present just like he was present there. Tonight, Jesus is big enough. Tonight, you can come straight to Jesus and not to a disciple. And tonight, Jesus can rid you of that thing that's been plaguing you and he can actually step you up to that next next step where you've having you've been having to go to but you didn't think you could for so long because your inadequacy what Jesus says of you will be of you if you allow it to happen amen amen ah how long verse 23 something really interesting starts happening here it says this if you can Jesus answered. The boy's, the boy's father said uh, uh, but if you can do anything take pity on us and help us And Jesus says, if I can, question mark, I'm Jesus. Of course I can. If you can, I speak things into existence. I was there with the Father when we made you out of dirt and we breathed on you and life was in your body. If I can. You imagine being Jesus, being all God, all human, being asked such a thing, if if I can. And, And it says over here in red letters, verse 23, if you can, Jesus said, And look, he doesn't say, of course I can, I'm Jesus. He doesn't say, of course I can, because I'm part of the Godhead, part of the Trinity. Look what Jesus says here. It's really specific. And he doesn't just say, if I can, of course I can, I'm Jesus. He doesn't doesn't say that at all. He says this. Jesus says, everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. Amen? Amen. Everything is possible for you that believe. Everything. He could have worded this so many different ways. He could have said that I come from the Father and I have come to do the Father's will. And he could have said, like he said in other places, that my only, will, my only food is to, is to finish my Father's will in heaven here on earth. He could have said all these different things. But Jesus takes the time and says, if I can. And he turns it around and says, matter of fact, you can. He says, everyone who believes in me can. You can do it. And he's saying this to a father who has been praying for his son's deliverance for his whole son's life and hasn't been able to deliver his son. He's saying this to a father who's tried probably going to doctors, tried going to the disciples, tried going to the teachers. No one could deliver him. And Jesus is saying, if I can, you can if you just believe. And this is what the man says in response to Jesus. He says, uh, in verse 24, it says this, Immediately the boy's father explained, explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus had begun a work with a man to do something that was greater than his own ability to do without the man starting this journey with enough faith to finish it. Before this man says, I believe, help me in my unbelief, Jesus said, you can do it if you believe. Whoever believes can do this. And Jesus has asked this man to come and do and to believe in him, even though at the beginning the man's faith wasn't perfect. It wasn't refined. He knew he needed help in his faith. Look, God's called us all to different, vast, all kinds of ministries and to worship and to ministries of of discipleship and of missionaries and of pulpit ministry and, 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 and ushering and all these things. And it always seems like, God, look at me. I'm not worthy to do the things you've called me. It's okay, because look what the word says. This man said, I believe, but that's all I have, but I'm not perfect. But could you help me? But could you help me? Listen, if we all wait and sit back for God to make us perfect before we start following the call that he has in our lives, we'll never get anything done. Never. It was never intended that you would have perfect faith, that you would have a perfect life, that you would have a perfect follow-through, that you would have a perfect understanding of his word, that you would have a perfect ability to hear his Holy Spirit before. That was never a predecessor for you to start and complete a ministry. All he says is have faith. If you have faith, you can do this. Is your faith broken tonight? Is it not enough? It's enough. God says you just have to have faith. You just start your walk. It might not be complete, but through the hardships, through loving first, through pursuing, he will perfect your faith. He will make it perfect. 
Look, man, when I first started doing missions, just getting there was the biggest deal. And then he just pushes you and he pushes you and he molds you and he shapes you. And I don't have the faith that I, that I do now when I began, but I still had to begin by faith even though it wasn't perfect. And I tell you now, my faith still isn't perfect. And I'm almost 40 years old and he's still stretching me and breaking me of things and making me depend more on him and, and making me go into uncomfortable situations. But I praise him for it because I get to know him more because of it. Look, if your faith isn't where it needs to be, but you know God's calling you, start that journey. Get on it. Do it. Life is passing by. The only thing worth doing is to do things that he's called you to do. Because one time, that when this life is over, that's the only thing that's going to last. We can go pursue things like college and careers that are all good. Marriages that are all good. But only one thing will last for all eternity. And you're eternal and I'm eternal. Is the things that we do in his name solely for him. That's the only things that will accompany us for the rest of our lives. I can have the best marriage, but I'm not going to have it in heaven. I can have the best kids. It's not going to have it in heaven. I got the most money. I'm not going to have it in heaven. The only things I'll be left with after everything's done and the fire of judgment judges the whole sum of my life will be the, the missions, the painting of places, the pouring into young people, the praying with other people, carrying my brother's burdens. These are the only things we'll be left with. And if you wait till you're complete to start these things, the enemy will have robbed you of half your life or maybe even better. Right now you're in your youth and you're in your full strength. You're able to go out and divide and conquer like never before because you have energy and faith because life hasn't beat you down yet. Don't let the enemy steal your promise by saying you're not good enough or your faith is not good enough because you can start the battle and God will increase your faith on the way. Amen? Amen. 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 I don't even know how long I've been preaching for. I think it's probably time for me to get kind of done, right? Verse 26. It says this, the spirit shrieked and convulsed him violently and he came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and he lifted him to his feet and he stood him up. Look, there's, there's things in your life and there's things in my life. And this is what the word of God is saying about those things. There's hopes and dreams and even promises and even even people as a whole that are around us that are so hopeless that the people around you said there, there's no hope and it's dead. It's a lost cause. Look, people used to say, I'm a lost cause. I was the black sheep in my family. I was the one who was dependent on, on drinking and drugs and cigarettes and, and all these things. I was the one who would come home from work every day to my family and drink myself to sleep every night. People would have looked at me and said, there's no hope Look, it's a corpse. This boy is dead. Don't let anyone speak that into your life. Don't let anybody come to you and speak death into your life. And don't let anyone look at you and say you're too young or you're just a girl or you're just a boy. Don't let them come to you just because things look a certain way. But realize this, even though something looks dead and looks like it has no hope, even though the tree looks like it'll never bud again, this is what the Lord can do. He could take anything that looks dead and raise it up to his feet and have it stand up again. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Don't forget about the promises that God has, has said unto you. Don't look at the situ situation that you're in with your own carnal eyes. Don't let people tell you that you're hopeless and you'll never amount to anything. Don't let people rain on your parade that you have hopes and ambitions to be a preacher or, 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 or a godly person or a worker in the church or a missionary. Don't let people say those things over you because the word of God says something different. It says that his, his thoughts are high up for you. He has hopes to, to prosper you and, and good thoughts towards you. Don't let anyone talk that into your life. It doesn't matter how bad off you are tonight. It doesn't matter how far down that road of sin that you feel like you can't get rid of because you've always had it. It doesn't matter if only people, even your mom and dad have lost hope in you. It doesn't matter because we serve a Lord who could take something that's seemingly dead and shake it to life and have it stand to its feet. That's who Jesus is. That's my Jesus. That's not Jesus 2,000 years ago. That's Jesus in this room, tangibly, here, tonight, more than two or three are gathered and he is in this place now I tell you now he's here now he's willing to heal now he's willing to fill now he's willing to speak into your hearts into your ears now he's willing to take you to that next step that you'll never thought you could make it to you understand if you would believe even now if your faith isn't complete you could just say father I believe but I need help and he'll help you he'll complete your faith and he says oh can I of course I can but you can too you just got to believe in me and this is what the 
the last part of it, the key, the last thing I want to close with, verse 29, it says this. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, why couldn't we take care of this? And Jesus replies, this kind come out only by prayer. And if you read in the Amplified, it says, these kinds come out only by prayer to the Father directly. Look, tonight we're going to have an opportunity as we stand to our feet at the end to come to the Father directly. You as sons and daughters of God, you have the name of Jesus to go before the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of everything. You go before the God who created everything and all the things that you've been dealing with and that you've been telling your friends about and that you've been struggling about. Tonight in this place, just like when the father of the convulsing boy went to Jesus, that same Jesus that with the word cast out every demon and made every bone and every, every sinuous individual, every fiber of that body come to life and, and spring to life. That same Jesus is here tonight and he's telling us through his word that I'm here. I'm here. You can come to me tonight and whatever is in your life that you can't deal with on your own, you could bring it to me in prayer. And when you bring these things to him in prayer, just like Peter was talking about it at his in them, we didn't plan that out, but uh, sometimes you don't see things being answered the way you want to. But just have trust when you come to Jesus and to the Father in prayer in the name of Jesus. Have trust in this, that the one who has the foreknowledge of the rest of your days, who made you, who knit you together in your mother's womb, knows what's best for you. And he knows how to answer prayers and give you exactly what you need. He knows what to not give you, as long as your heart is to serve him and be a tool to be used by him. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to stand to your feet. Uh, and I'm just going to lead us in prayer if that's okay. And not only that, but uh, we have a lot of good people here. Mike's here tonight. My wife's here tonight. Jenny's here tonight. Uh, Adi's here tonight. Sam and Larissa are here tonight. And, and, uh, and Jordan's here tonight. And they're all, they're all leaders of small groups. And uh, even me, I don't, I don't look like it, but I'm actually a deacon in this church. And uh, I could do stuff, right? Uh, tonight, if you're bringing things to Jesus and you're like, hey, man, I got to bring something to the Lord. And I know I got to bring it to the Lord specifically, but you need help in prayer. You need someone to agree with you as you bring it to the Lord in prayer. You could ask any one of us. That's what we live for. We live to pray with you guys and see you guys get to a place in your walk that's better than our own. Amen. Amen. So let's just uh, bow our heads. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus.